What's up everybody and welcome to my new video series. In this series we're going to cover the basics of Git and in this first video we will go over the key concepts that you should probably know about when working with Git. So if you already know all these terms then you can go uh, straight to the next video where we dive right into how to actually use Git. If you only know uh, only know some of these terms then you can check out the video description because there I have provided the timestamps to each of these terms. So then you can go straight to, ones, straight to the ones that you're not familiar with. And if you don't know anything about Git yet, then you should probably watch this whole video first. So let's get right, uh, right to the first concept, which is version control. Uh, if you would uh, want to summarize version control in one sentence, uh, in one sentence then you could probably say that version control is a system that allows you to record the changes you've made to a file or set of files over time. So for example, when you start a, a new coding project, then that project has to live somewhere. So currently then you create a new folder in which you put all the files that are necessary for that folder. And this folder is then what you version control. And what this means is that as you uh, keep working on the files and keep developing your project, uh, what you can do is along the way you can create save points or in Git terms, these are called commits. And whenever you decide to uh, save the state of your project, what Git does, it basically takes a snapshot of this folder here. So it takes a snapshot of what all the files in the folder looked like at each particular moment or at that particular moment. Uh, and then the resulting uh, stream of snapshots gives you then, so to say, a history of how the project evolved over time. And there are two major benefits for having such a history. The first one is obviously that you have documented the coding process, so you're always able to check and understand uh, what exact changes you made at each of these steps. And this is uh, especially helpful when you're working collaboratively on a project or for example, uh, when you work on your own projects and maybe then uh, abandon it for a time and then after a while go back to it and then you get uh, can get a better understanding of what you have done. So that's the first benefit. And the second benefit and maybe even more important one is that uh, version control allows you to be much more experimental during the development of your code. So you can then simply test things out. And that's because once a state of the project is saved into such a commit, then you can't really screw things up because you can always revert the project back to that particular state. So for example, let's say at the moment here we are at commit six. And then let's say we have an idea for a new feature uh, for our project, but we're not ultimately sure or we're not sure if you want to ultimately implement it or if it might uh, introduce some uh, bugs into our code base. With Git, we can then simply test it out and uh, create a new commit. And then let's say after a while, uh, for whatever reason, we decide to not keep the feature. So for that uh, reason, then we simply revert the project back to the previous state of commit six. So then the files are reverted back to what they looked like when this commit here was originally created. So that is version control. Next up is the commit. So whenever you save the state of your project, i.e. take a snapshot of your project folder, you create a so-called commit. So the question then is, when should you create such a commit? And the answer to that is whenever there is a meaningful change in your project. So there's a difference in how you approach saving the state of the project versus saving a file within that project. So for example, let's say you start working on a new feature, but then uh, you get stuck and you stop working. So in that case, you then obviously save the file because you don't want to lose your progress, but you don't save the state of the project because you're in the middle of uh, developing that new feature. And then let's say on the next day, 
you uh, keep working on the feature again and then you finish it up. In that case, then you would again save the file to not lose your progress, but additionally, you would also save the state of your project because finishing up that uh, new feature would represent a meaningful change in your project. So then accordingly, you would then create a new commit for that. And here it is also important to mention that there are really no clear rules what actually uh, constitutes a meaningful change. Uh, it could be something small like updating the readme, or it could be something bigger like uh, coding up a new feature. So uh, when you actually create a commit is something that you have to decide on your own on a case by case basis. So that's a commit. Next up are the components of a commit. Namely, with each commit, there is some additional information associated with that. So the first one is uh, the so-called hash of the commit, which is a unique 40 character long uh, string. And it consists of the numbers between 0 and 9 and the letters A to F. And this simply serves as a unique identifier uh, for the respective commit. So the commits aren't actually numbered numerically like uh, I have depicted here in those circles. Then the next piece of information is the author or creator of the commit. And here you get uh, the name of the creator and uh, his or her email address. And this is um, uh, especially important when working collaboratively on a project so that you know who created the commit and how you can contact them. Next is then a timestamp when the commit was created. And lastly, there's a so-called commit message, which describes what the commit is about in a, a concise way. So what changes were made at that particular commit. So here in this example, the readme was updated. So those are the components of a commit. Next up is the concept of reachability. Namely, for each commit, uh, Git stores a reference to the parent or parents of that commit. That's why these circuits here are connected with arrows going into one direction. So commit seven here has two parents, commit five and six, and those commits in turn, in turn only have one parent, which is commit four. So what this means is that from if you are at commit seven, you can reach commit five and six, and from those in turn, you can then reach four, and from that, you can reach uh, commit three and so on. So if you are at commit number seven, then you can reach all the other commits in the commit history. But if you are, for example, here at commit five, then you can only reach commits one to four, but uh, commits six, uh, six and seven are not reachable. So that's the concept of reachability. Next up, uh, in order to understand the free errors, we first need to understand what hidden files and folders are. And as the name implies, these files and folders are uh, normally hidden. So depending on your operating system, you might uh, need to change your settings in order, in, in order to be able to see them. So for example, uh, I'm on Windows. So, uh, and the way you can do that is like this. So if you open this folder here, then it seems to be empty. But if you click here on view and then uh, check this box here uh, that states hidden items, then we can see that there's actually a folder uh, in this folder, which is called dot git. And this is also very common that uh, hidden files or folders start with a period in their, na uh, in their name. So that are hidden files and folders. Next up are the three areas. So in order to be able to create a commit, we need to know about the three areas and how they relate to each other. So the first one is uh, the so-called repository or repo for short, and this simply contains our commit history. And the repository is actually just this .git folder within our project folder. And uh, Git automatically creates this folder once you start version controlling uh, your project. So that's the repository. 
then there is the working directory and here git lists uh, the files or folders that have been changed compared to the so-called checked out commit and what the checked out commit is we are going to cover when we talk about head but for now it's only important to know that uh, the checked out commit is the commit that represents uh, the state that the project is currently in so for example let's say the project is currently in the state of commit 4 then in this example here the readme and this game.py file uh, have been changed compared to this commit and the working directory is actually just the project folder itself so whenever you either uh, add modify or delete a file or folder then the respective file or folder will get listed in uh, the working di directory as having been uh, modified so that's the working directory and then the last area is the staging area and this so to say sits between the working directory and the repository and we can use it to have control over what changes are actually uh, going to be added to the next commit and the way that this works is that once there are files or folders listed in the working directory then you can move them into the staging area and then <clears throat> when you now create a new commit then whatever is in the staging area will be added to the next commit so in this example then the changes that were made to game.py would be uh, added then into the next commit but not the changes that were made in the readme and uh, the main purpose of the staging area is to enable us uh, uh, to create commits that represent a meaningful change of our project and now just as a side note uh, to be really precise uh, in the working directory git actually lists the files and folders that have been changed compared to the staging area but if there is nothing in the staging area then it will list the files and folders that have been changed compared to the checked out commit so uh, that are the three areas next up is dot git ignore so sometimes when running a, a certain program certain files or folders get automatically created for example when you run a python file usually a pycache folder gets created and these machine generated files or folders are normally not really necessary for the project that we want to version control so accordingly we would like git to ignore these types uh, of files and folders so it shouldn't list them in the working directory and the way that we can do that is with a so-called dot git ignore file and this is simply a text file and in the text file you can list the files and folders that you want to ignore so here i've listed the package folder and then git would ignore this uh, specific folder and uh, in this git ignore file you can also use specific patterns to ignore certain types of files and folders so for example here with this star and then and then dot txt this would uh, ignore all the text files that we have uh, and if you want to know more about what patterns you can use you can go to this web page here and then check out what patterns exist and one thing to mention uh, is that also the things that you will list in the git ignore file they will only affect uh, files or folders that are currently untracked so files or folders that are already tracked with git so that are already tracked in the commit history they won't be affected when you put them into uh, the dot git ignore file so that's uh, git ignore next up is the branch so when we talked about version control we said that probably the biggest advantage of version control is that you can be much more experimental during the development of your code and simply test things out and this is what branches are especially useful for and just like the name implies you can use them <coughs> uh, 
to branch off from your main line of development and then keep working on your project without messing with that main line. So to commit history doesn't actually have to be just linear, but you can have uh, different branches of commit. And then to be, uh, to be able to better keep track of those different branches, each has a unique label. So the branch itself is actually just a pointer that points at a specific commit. And here in this example, we have a master branch and this gets automatically created by Git once you start version controlling your project. And usually this rep uh, represents then the main line of development. And then here, this branch one, this was then specifically created by us to be able to branch off from the main line of development. And here, by the way, you can uh, give it a name, uh, whatever name you want. And on this branch, there are then uh, these three additional commits created. So that's uh, what a branch is. Next up is the head. And this is a special kind of pointer. And it acts, so to say, like a cursor and shows us what we are currently looking at in uh, the commit history. So what state the project is currently in. So here, in this example, the head points at branch one and branch one in turn points at uh, commit number seven. So what it means is that currently branch one uh, is checked out. And so uh, the project is in the state of uh, commit seven. So now if we want to re revert the project back to the master branch, then we need to move the head uh, over to master or in Git terms, uh, we need to check out master. And just as a side note, if you directly check out a commit via its hash, then you are in what's called a detached head state because uh, head is not pointing at directly at the branch. And another thing to know about head is that whenever you create a new commit, the head and whatever branch it is pointing at gets uh, moved forward. <clears throat> so that's what the head is. Next up is the concept of merging. So when you create a second branch to branch off from your main line of development, then at some point you most likely want to update your main line to also include the changes from your branch. So in this case here, the mass branch should, should then include uh, the changes in the code from uh, commit seven. And uh, in Git terms, this is called then uh, that you want to merge in branch one into the master branch. And there are two types of different merges. And the first one is called a fast forward merge. And this applies when uh, the paths of the different branches haven't actually di uh, diverged. So for example, in this case here, we can reach commit number four from commit seven. So then in order to update the master branch, uh, to include the uh, changes from commit seven or to merge in the branch one into master, we sim what we have to do or what Git has to do is to simply move this pointer here forward in the commit history. And that's why uh, this type of merge is called a fast forward merge. And in this case, the commit history is actually still linear. So that's the first type of merge. And the other type is called a freeway merge. So <clears throat> this applies when uh, the paths of the branches have actually diverged. So here in this example, uh, you can't reach commit eight uh, from commit seven. So in this case, then Git can simply move uh, the master branch forward uh, to commit seven. So uh, uh, then to include the changes of that commit. So what it needs to do then is in order to bring those two paths together, Git has to create a new commit. And the reason why this type of merge is called uh, a freeway, freeway merge is because in order to create this new uh, merge commit here, Git uses three other commits, namely the one uh, commit uh, before the paths diverged, so commit four here, and then 
uh, the most recent commits on both of the branches. So commit seven and eight in this example. And what Git then does is it looks at commit four and checks what the files in the folder looked like uh, at this commit. And then it checks what changes we are made uh, on commit seven and eight. And then in order to create this new commit, it simply takes the files uh, from commit four and adds the changes from commit seven and eight. So for example, let's say our project consists of only one file and we have these diverged paths in the commit history. Then here, uh, as you can see at commit one, uh, the file has a certain number of lines. And then here at commit two, some line at the beginning was added and at commit three, some line at the end of the file was added. And now to bring those two paths together, to merge uh, those different branches, Git has to create a new commit that should include the changes from both of these uh, branches. And the way that it does it is it takes the file from commit one and simply adds the lines from commit uh, two and three to create then uh, the file for commit four. So that's a free eye merge and that's a merging in general. Next up is the concept of a merge conflict. So sometimes when doing a freeway merge, it can happen that the same line of the same file uh, was modified on both of the branches. And this leads then to a merge conflict. So for example, let's say again that our project consists of one file and we have these diverged paths in the his, uh, commit history. And at commit one again, uh, the file has a certain number of lines. Then here at commit two, uh, a line at the beginning was uh, modified and at commit three, the same line was modified, but in a different way. So now in this case, when then bringing the paths together, uh, Git can possibly know what changes it should uh, include uh, in the new commit because it doesn't actually understand anything about the logic of the code. So what it does instead is it includes both of these changes and marks uh, the section of the file as a merge conflict. And what we then have to do is we have then to manually, manually edit this file to resolve this merge conflict. So we have to decide should the code look more like it did on commit two or maybe it should look more like it did on commit three or maybe some uh, some combination of both of those uh, commits. So that way then we would resolve uh, the, this merge conflict. So that's uh, what a merge conflict is. Next up are the different workflows that you can use with branches. And there are basically two, diff two different types. One is to use long running branches. So for example, you might have your master branch, which contains the stable version of your code. And then you might have a development branch on which you then develop your code. So what you do then is you check out the development branch, work on your code. And then when you're satisfied with it, you go back to master and merge in the develop development branch into master. Then again, you go back to development, go ahead, go back to master and update master. So with such a long run running branch, you go, you basically go to the development branch, go ahead and then simply always update master. So that's uh, the first type of workflow. The other type is uh, to use so-called uh, topic branches. And these uh, branches are one of branches that you, uh, that are solely created for working on a specific change. For example, on a new feature or on fixing a certain bug. And then Accordingly, uh, you give those topic branches a descriptive name that describes what you want to do on that branch. And then once you're done uh, with that change, you then again delete the topic branch. So for example, let's say you want to work on a certain feature. So you create a new uh, branch for that, check it out, and then uh, work on your code for the feature. And then when you're satisfied, go back to master and update master. And then when you're done, you simply delete uh, the feature branch again. And then let's say you can do the same thing with uh, a bug fix. So you go, you go to that branch, 
fix that bug, go back to master and update master again and then uh, delete uh, the bug fix branch. So those are the two uh, main different types of workflows that you can have. So uh, with that now we have covered uh, all the topics for the branch. Next up is the remote repo. So oftentimes you might not just want to work alone on a project, but you want to uh, work on a project in a team with, uh, with different people. So in that case, you would then need some sort of central repo that anybody has access to. And that's exactly what the remote repo is for. So there aren't actually just uh, the three areas that we have to work with, but there are now uh, four areas. And the repo that we've been working with so far is actually called the local repo. So as the name implies, this repo exists locally on your computer and the remote repo on the other hand exists somewhere on a, uh, in a remote place. So typically somewhere on the in internet. And probably one of the most popular, popular services for hosting remotes is uh, the service provided by GitHub. So now let's have a look at uh, a typical workflow with a remote repo. So the remote contains a uh, commit history and acts as a central repo. And then anybody with access to that repo can then pull uh, this commit history in their own local repository. So then they can create a copy of the commit history in the remote. And yeah, just a side note, uh, locally, uh, the remote is by default called uh, origin. So this origin slash master branch here uh, is simply there to indicate where the master branch of the remote is currently at. So this branch here really just serves as a pointer and you can't even uh, check it out. Okay, so then let's say then when we have uh, the up-to-date uh, history, commit history, then what you can do is locally we can make our changes to the code and keep developing it and then when we are satisfied with our changes then we can push our mass, uh, local master branch to the remote master branch so that we then have remote uh, that we had have then the most up-to-date code also in the remote and then again anybody with access to that can then pull uh, these updates into their own local repo and uh, this repo you can also just use uh, when you're working individually on a project which is what we're going to do in this tutorial in that case then obviously then you wouldn't use uh, the remote for uh, collaboration but simply you can use it to either just uh, share your project publicly or you can also just use it to uh, have a backup of your project in the cloud. So that's uh, the remote repo. Next up is the command line interface. And this is simply a text-based interface for interacting with computer programs, for example, like an operating system. So uh, instead of using uh, the mouse cursor and icons and menus of a graphical user interface, uh, we have to issue commands to the command line. And examples of a command line are the command prompt on Windows or in Linux and Mac OS, it's called a terminal. And the commands that we're going to use in this tutorial uh, are all Git specific ex uh, except for one, which is CD. And this stands for change directory and we can simply use it to move between directories. So if you want to go to this uh, desktop, for example, then we would say CD desktop. So now we are on the desktop and if we want to uh, move back to the parent directory of the desktop, so to our, to our home directory, we would then simply say cd dot dot. So then we are again in the home directory. And that's already, already uh, everything we need to know about uh, the command line interface. And with that, we finally know what Git is. Namely, it's a version control software that we're going to interact with using a command line interface. And you can go to the Git website and there you can download it for your respective operating system. And so with that now, 
we have covered uh, all the key concepts that you probably know when working with Git. So in the upcoming video, we're going to see how we can actually use Git. So thanks for watching and hopefully I will see you in the next video.